Hi everybody, Juan Carlos Bagnell here. Now, if you followed any of my writings or any of my video blogging, I'm sure you're aware that I'm very much a futurist, a tech optimist. Of course, it's very important for us to check in occasionally to see what tech might be used in ways that we're not necessarily proud of or wish to encourage or in ways that we might need to stop. So joining me today, and I'm very happy to have you here, is Carol Smolensky. You did it, Juan. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> More both names, all right. Uh, and you're the, the I'm the executive, executive director. director of ECPAT USA. And if you wouldn't mind explaining for my audience, what is ECPAT? Sure. ECPAT is uh, an international organization based in Bangkok that works to protect every child's human right to grow up free from sexual exploitation. ECPAT actually stands for End Child Prostitution, Child Pornography, and Trafficking of Children. So I have to express a little bit of shock when I was given the notes regarding our meeting today. Uh, I still have a very old world internet view of oh. what child pornography and child trafficking yeah. is like in that, you know, that, that colored from the days of dial up modems where I'm sure there are some skeezy guys out there on a message board somewhere sharing a couple photos, yeah. but it's, it's shameful behavior and it's not a widespread or a monetized industry. And so reading through the literature, I was very surprised to see that not only is that completely not true, mm. but that we're actually starting to see this behavior on the rise. Yeah, so um, there is this industry called child pornography, which really is a complete misnomer, frankly, um, because what child pornography is these days really is not your 16 or 17 year old dressed in flimsy clothes and in erotic pose, mm -hmm. child pornography is a six or seven year old being violently raped by a group of men. It is actually an extremely upsetting industry uh, fed by a big demand of bad people who have this, this need to exploit, abuse, and see pictures of kids being exploited and abused. And it's quite horrific, frankly. And it's huge. Um, it's not, you know, as I said, some sort of benign pornography. We actually like to use the terminology child abuse imagery, and law enforcement likes to use the terminology child abuse imagery as well. Not child pornography, because it, it sort of cleans up what the actual problem is. Right. And it's really sin in the last 15 years since uh, digital cameras came into existence and the internet came into existence that it has exploded. Um, it used to be that, you know, a guy had to develop a picture and <laughs> put it in the mail. Yeah. And in fact, law enforcement had the problem under control. Um, but because it's now so hidden, um, it's become a huge industry. And it is monetized. I mean, there are two aspects to it. There is the buying and selling of child abuse imagery, but then there's a whole lot of non-monetized, the part that is just trading of child abuse imagery. And, and it's a huge, huge problem. And so we, in, in, in watching this culture sort of expand, we've been seeing that parallel, the expansion that we've seen in more mobile technologies, more temporary technology. Yeah. You, you brought up photos, but you know, e even back when we had some notion of child pornography and child abuse imagery in media, it was always like, well, there's a JPEG that lives on someone's yeah. hard drive, yeah. and we can sometimes find that guy, yeah. and we can shut him down, yeah. but that's no longer the case. Yeah, I mean, I think the two biggest areas now are peer-to-peer -peer networks, and that is clear really the biggest way that they're traded. Um, and then there's the live webcam problem of somebody setting up um, a live, you know, viewing of child abuse taking place and then selling subscriptions to people watching that, which of course doesn't then live anywhere on any server. Right. It's just it's just out and, there. And in a very insidious way, I'm sure feeds more behavior for this sort of temporary interaction, which is then yeah. going to lead to hurting even more children yes, right, exactly. to sort of fuel that industry. Yeah, exactly. In in dealing with some of uh, these issues, you're you're currently operating in seventy nine countries, seventy four countries, seventy four countries mm -hmm. across the world, and and there's no notion of this being something that is unique to one area or no. some impoverished nation. You were even discussing, yeah. I, I saw on another write-up, where this type of behavior is probably taking place here in the United States. Oh, it's everywhere. Yeah. And it crosses all borders. And that's an, that has been another challenge for law enforcement um, because you might find child pornography or child abuse imagery on a 
you know, on a computer here in your town, but in fact it's being produced somewhere else and then the server is somewhere else. And so law enforcement really has stepped up over the years and created these uh, international entities where they work together. There was actually recently this case, in fact, a webcam case that was just broken this past year that took place in the Philippines, um, but the first notion that it was happening was found by a U.S. Uh, immigration and Customs Enforcement agent in Portland, Maine, who was the first one to learn about it, and then they worked with the Philippines law enforcement to actually investigate and break the case. In that case, the victims were two years old, nine years old, and 11 years old, and they were being um, abused by their parents, frankly. Moving through the, the sort of methods that we've been using to try and halt these communities or try and halt this behavior, it really does sound like for as high tech as the situation gets, that the, mo that, that the tools that we really have at our disposal right now are all very low tech. Yeah. The intelligence gathering, yeah. the people on the ground, and, yeah. and it's sort of a cockroach problem. Yeah. That yes, when you right, find exactly. one, you yes. can be sure that there is a proliferation yeah. that's it's even more difficult to uncover. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's going to be uh, a tech problem to fix. It's not, law enforcement cannot keep up because of the vast numbers of child abuse images that are being produced. There are millions of child abuse images being produced. That doesn't mean that there are millions of kids necessarily because they just trade and share and copy the same pictures, but it's, it, we can't leave it up to law enforcement because they are overwhelmed. So it really is going to be good people who work in the tech industry who decide to put their heads together and say, okay, here's the problem and here's how we can fix it. I'm a child rights advocate. I'm looking to you guys to help us solve this problem. And what has been your experiences so far in reaching out to the tech community? I mean, the, there's there's a such there, there's such an appalling feeling when you look at these things. You know, I'm shooting this on smartphones right now. I've got a smartphone in my pocket. I'm sure you've got mm -hmm. some kind of technology. Mm -hmm. We we really embrace this. It helps us communicate. It helps us share. It becomes such a valuable part of our human experience now. That when you discover that these same tools are also being used in this fashion. One, just the surprise of it, because I don't seek out this kind of behavior. Yeah. I'm not aware yeah. of what, how much is happening. Yeah. But have you encountered positive experiences, resistance? I know yeah. monitoring is a really touchy subject right now. Yeah. We've got the NSA facility, which yeah. is going up in Utah. Yeah. Yet, this could be one scenario where that kind of cooperation could be beneficial to a number of different yeah. communities. Yeah, yeah. It's tricky, and I and there are good people who work at some of the big companies who have sat down uh, with ECPAT and with other groups to try to figure out how to do this. So, so there is activity taking place. Um, I'm not quite sure how to depict that, the, how to right. describe that without them, you know, <laughs> without having asked for their permission yet about right. what to say about that. Well, and, and there sure, are steps forward. I'm sure they're like the, the actual individual operations have to be just as fluid as the people yeah. that they're trying to yeah. catch. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not going to sit here and tell you what their tactics are, you <laughs> dirty people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I actually also want to clear up one uh, misconception that I think we often get, that law enforcement will look for and arrest the poor innocent guy who was just looking at regular porn and ended up downloading, you know, By a accident, teenager. Some yes, piece I mean, of I, media. yes, I feel like that. That's in people's minds. Oh well, you don't want to get a guy in trouble for that kind of thing. Right. But in fact, the only people who law enforcement actually has enough resources to go after are the big collectors, the real abusers of the little kids. So we really, we really, I want you to just. Think about whatever that. your As, individual recreational activity yes, may be. Thank you. <laughs> you know your audience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a horrific thing that you wouldn't like. <laughs> right. Uh, well, and I'm sure the appetite for this is something that has propagated because of the anonymity. Here's another area that I want to just mention that I, I, I feel is a positive thing that we should be doing in the future. Um, young people are often preyed upon uh, by bad guys on the internet. Um, the little kids, of course, are the ones who are most vulnerable um, and most subject to being drawn into the problem by their family members or friends of the family. Um, but as teenagers grow up, um, the kind of prevention education that we rely on to tell kids, be careful on the internet, mm -hmm. be careful who you talk to, be careful you know, what information you put out there, 
Um, that's all well and good. But as they grow up, they don't really want to be governed by what their parents say anymore. Right. And they don't want to report to adults or ask adults because, frankly, they know better well, than us. And, and I see digital versions of the same kinds of behavior that I know I engaged in. Yeah. Like, yeah, I'm going to ride my bicycle without my Yes, right, mom. exactly. Ha, ha. It's exactly. Only now on a smartphone. <laughs> I really think... But kids are smart too, and they and so I feel like we have to convene groups of kids to talk about how to put in place youth-friendly prevention messaging, youth-friendly activities where they share among themselves information about how we're going to keep ourselves safe. You know, it's really kids these days. We adults, you know, certainly people my age can't tell them how to keep safe. Right. Also, they're always. Uh, in new platforms and new types of apps and new media they become the vanguard. that we have no yeah. idea about. We've got to just make sure they are constantly educated and educating each other and having these discussions among themselves about what's safe, what's not safe, what do you do if you get in a situation where you're not sure, you know, and, and where kids are helping kids. That's what I really think is the future. In, in dealing with these social awareness causes and the, the, the quality of education, trying to improve the quality of outreach, trying to improve the quality of discussion, because we can take something like a, like a, something that's equally impacting, but maybe not quite so as vile. You know, I'm, I'm a big supporter of the It Can Wait campaign or texting while driving. Laws aren't changing behavior. Yeah. People, it is against the law here in California. And I recently posted an editorial of someone who was watching a movie on a tablet oh, while driving on the 405. And of course, oh, the irony God. of me taking my the picture yeah. of that from my vehicle, <laughs> I wasn't lost I on know. my followers out there. And so in, in, in creating that kind of grassroots and reaching out to the tech community, is that where we're maybe seeing the first positive steps towards yes. curbing this behavior? Yes. I mean, there has to be a whole lot of education and kids have to be involved in it. And I want to convene a summit of youth to talk among themselves and to put, put out there, you know, to be on the front lines of Oh, and to empower protection. the fact that they already have these tools. Yeah. To actually encourage them to seek them out and make use of them. Yeah, yeah. So speaking of those tools, where might some of my viewers be able to find more information on ECPAT? ECPAT.net. <laughs> and, and from there, will they, 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 you, there are resources for them for local community outreach, for well, furthering the discussion? Um, I, I, I know that there were a series of like social media links, so people can kind of get involved in the conversation. That yes, way. yes, right. And also ECPATUSA.org. Um, which is the U.S. branch of ECPAT and ECPAT.net, which is the international uh, sort of umbrella for all of us working all over the world. And so, and then along with this this social awareness campaign, uh, ECPAT was just recently honored by the Hilton Foundation. The Hilton Foundation. Foundation. We are so flattered and excited that the Conrad N. Hilton Foundation this year gave ECPAT its humanitarian prize for 2013. It is such a huge... Um, uh, pat on the back for our work, which so often is sort of pushed to the sidelines and to have the Hilton Foundation um, highlight us and give us the prize is just, you know, we're just well, I, I, so excited. I really think that there's that notion of you bring up this kind of scenario and I'm just going to shy away from it because, yes. hey, that's not my bag. I don't want to talk about it. But mm -hmm. being exposed on that level, on that stage, are, are, are we finding more people engaging in conversation? Are yes, yeah. Conversation? There's no question that having had the Hilton Prize puts a spotlight on our issue. Uh, we're getting much more attention, many more calls. It's um, uh, heavenly. <laughs> So I, I very much want to thank you for joining us and in, in, in sharing this kind of information yeah, with my audience. It's, it's such a pleasure. It's definitely you. something where I am, I'm hoping we can uh, continue sort of exposing problems like this because mm -hmm. I really do feel that for all of my tech optimism, that problems with tech will probably be solved by good people with tech. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would definitely recommend everyone go check out uh, ECPAT. I'm going to be leaving links below this video and in my blog post so that people can go out and seek more information. You can follow them on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn. I saw I LinkedIn yeah, contacts. Right. So yeah. they're, they're uh, prolific amongst all of the social networks, and I would highly recommend you all go check them out. Mm -hmm. As always, I'm Juan Carlos Bagnell, and uh, thank you for watching. I'll catch you all on the next video.